morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone, and thanks for joining this virtual talk at Google. My name is Danielle Perzik. I'm a researcher here at Google, and today I'm here with Professor Moshe Barr to discuss his new book, Mind Wandering, How It Can Improve Your Mood and Boost Your Creativity. Professor Moshe Barr is an internationally renowned cognitive neuroscientist whose research has made many important contributions in the fields of perception, cognition, and psychiatry. He did his PhD at the University of Southern California in LA, and he's received many awards and honors, including the prestigious 21st Century Science Initiative Award from the McDonald Foundation and the Hebb Award from the International Neural Network Society. He's the former director of the Cognitive Neuroscience Lab at Harvard Medical School, and he currently lives in Israel where he heads the Gonda Multidisciplinary Brain Research Center at Bar Ilan University. So today I'm going to get the conversation started by asking some questions about Professor Barr's book, and then I'll open it up for questions from the audience. So let's welcome Professor Barr. Hi. Thank Hello. You. Hi, Danielle. I should say at the onset, I feel like I know you from reading your book. You, you <laughs> color your writing with all of these personal stories and you make abstract ideas accessible through these concrete examples that we can all relate to. And that's often a real challenge for scientists, especially when the topics counter a lot of these intuitions that we have about our own minds. And I think one of the reasons that you're able to do this is because you offer a framework for thinking about thinking. And before we, we dive into this framework, I thought it would be helpful for the audience to understand how you arrived at this new synthesis. So you describe a combination of a diverse body of work spanning different areas in cognitive psychology and neuroscience, your own research, and then also your personal foray into mindfulness meditation. Can you talk a little bit about these joint inspirations and how they led you to writing your book? Yeah, so I think it, it started with... Uh... My initial research program actually that, that already began in my uh, PhD studies, I was just naively interested in how we recognize objects, how our visual objects represented and recognized in the brain. And this led to the realization that actually the way we show them in the lab, individual objects on the screen, this is not how it happens in the world. And I started thinking about collection of objects in our environment, all these typical arrangements that, that we see and realize that actually there's no such thing as object in isolation in our environment. There's always something near an object. And not only that, the objects that, that tend to appear together tend to appear together often. We call it statistical regularities. All these statistics that I'm sure that you with your background are familiar with, but the idea that the statistics keeps repeating in our environment and we get used to the idea that we, uh, we expect certain objects in kitchens, certain objects in, in, in the museum, certain objects in a conference room, with different probabilities, but nevertheless, these things are associated. Objects are associated with each other and tend to appear together. And when we started thinking about associations, we uh, uh, had to stop and, and, and think why why this kind of an associative uh, um, network representation. It confers a couple of uh, benefits. One of them is that it's easy to store. It's easy for you to store a new type of vegetable close to other vegetables that you're familiar with or to the location where you studied or, or, or were exposed to it the first time. So it helps storing, but it also helps retrieving. If you're looking for a certain vegetable in your memory, you go to the vegetable areas or the vegetable distribution uh, of activity. But what really fascinated me was the idea that actually this associative representation also help in generating predictions. So when I tell you you're about um, to enter a kitchen, you know to expect a refrigerator, a sink, a stove, certain objects with different probabilities, with different likelihoods, but nevertheless, you are ready for what's about to happen. It, this facilitates how you find your way around. It helps, it facilitate, facilitates uh, finding your things, accomplishing your goals, surviving, you know, protecting yourself, enjoying your environment. So even if these are mundane examples and un Fortunately or not, we're mainly uh, busy with predicting the, the most mundane things about what happens if I drop this pen on the floor. Uh, the, I, we, I'm not talking about predictions about the stock market or the Super Bowl. It's really more like um, predictions about what's going to wait for me when I turn left on this street or, in, or behind this room or where are the restroom or where is my car. Um, so then you start thinking about predictions and association. Uh, it really all hell broke loose. So they realized that uh, you have all this uh simulations going on in our mind that that we really have it's not only predicting uh if there's lightning there is uh thunder but rather 
uh, or a train, a sound of a train, and then the train appearing, we actually take it much, much uh, deeper in our mind by creating simulations. I don't want to overextend my uh, my uh, answer here, but we're, I'll be happy to talk about simulations more as we advance. Yeah, well, so you were just kind of hinting at there's there's this new framework, relatively new framework in the neurosciences, the brain as a prediction machine. And that's been kind of akin to the theory of evolution in terms of how much work it's done for us and being able to interpret um, empirical mm -hmm. findings about the brain. So can you just say a little bit more about that framework to set you up for, for talking about your own framework? Right, yeah. First of all, I have to say uh, uh, a funny thought I had this morning because the, the idea of prediction machine did come to my mind. And I kind of imagine that I only heard it from guys. Like the whole machine business is a, it's something that uh, that's something powerful about it, but I think a little bit too technical. I don't I don't know I don't think about the brain as a machine. That's that's mm. what I want to say. But it is yeah. um, uh, it is indeed an, an engulfing uh, um, framework that has taken neuroscience, especially cognitive and computational neuroscience, by storm. And the idea here is that we, re I mean, the extreme, and I'm not necessarily embracing it, the extreme relies on, on Helmholtz and thinking about uh, perception as inference. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is that uh, when we look at something, rather than recognizing it bottom up, we, we generate a prediction and then we com compare this prediction that we generated top down to the information that entering that enters our cortex via the senses so there is an image that i contrast with my prediction i subtract one minus the other and i get a prediction error and then there is a loop to minimize this prediction error so let's update our pr prediction until there is no prediction error and at the end, your prediction is your perception because there is the, what you predict is exactly what's out there. It's a little bit extreme for my taste, but it's still the same idea that uh, we use our memory. And, and in my mind, the, the real role of memory is to help us generate predictions. It's not to reminisce on our, our wedding or whatever. It's really uh, there to help us utilize our experience so that we can perform and enjoy better our lives. So it's so so the prediction, yeah, the predictive coding or the or the brain is a predicting prediction organ. Uh that's the idea, yeah. So I think there's one more piece of information that will be really helpful um, to, to set you up for talking about your ideas. And that's this surprising finding that there's a network in the brain, the default mode network or DMN, that consistently correlates with mind wandering. So could you go over a little bit about what we understand about that and also why it's this really great case study for how science progresses? Yeah, that, that's a great uh, topic to discuss. So I'm glad that you, uh, you're you raising it. So I have to be a little technical to understand, so for people to understand the beauty of this finding and the beauty of our illusion initially. So uh, this was maybe about 20 years ago, the early days of functional MRI. So everybody knows MRI and, and this really images uh, structural uh, in the body but also and also in the brain the fMRI the functional MRI as I'm sure you know very well the functional part is the ability to see the brain functioning ie being able to see activity or a proxy of activity so we actually for the first time were able to stick people in the magnet as we like to say and have them engage in all kind of tasks you know looking at people uh, faces faces of, of people that they know versus they don't know uh verbs versus nouns uh, sounds of certain or tickling in their feet whatever and we can then take the activity that happens in the brain in one condition we average a lot of trials from this condition minus the other condition right and in between this this blocks of conditions let's say the faces okay so faces that you know then there is nothing and then faces you don't know then nothing again faces that you know nothing and this nothing we call it the rest period we you know meant to do two things to help uh, other subjects or the participants to rest a little bit and also for our computers back then in the beginning that the computers were weaker and they really needed to um some time to reconstruct all these images and all kind of uh, mathematical things behind the scenes and this is the funny part, the implicit assumption of scientists has been that while subjects are just lying there with no task, they're just resting, the brain is probably also resting. And this has been, again, it, it's been implicit, but still dominated. And nobody really cared about what happens in the brain during rest until some uh, uh, brilliant scientists in, New, in, uh, in St. Louis, uh, Marcus Rakel and, and uh, Peterson, and other good people, and also uh, at MGH, where I was at Harvard, people noticed that actually the, 
the brain is very active while we're not doing anything. Okay, and not only that it is very active, and I'll talk in a second about how very active it is. Uh, it's very consistent, and then people published about it and start comp comparing, and we realized there is a giant network of areas working in concert during rest, uh, but pretty consistently across individuals, across labs, across continents. When you we, when you leave people to their own devices, you look at their brain, and there is this massive activation. And we all know that the body requires a lot of energy, and the brain requires, they say, about 20% energy of, of the brain of, of the body. And about half, you know, 47% of the time, we are busy wondering. That's some estimates that were published in science. So I'm sure that I and, and, and by, by my friends, so I definitely uh, believe these estimates. The idea here is that really about half of the time, which is pretty stunning num number, half of the time we're oriented inwardly and dealing with all these simulations in mind wandering. And so this finding that the, the brain is always on, that's another way in which the analogy that the mind is like the computer kind of falls apart, right? That yeah. the mind falls apart? That the, the analogy that the mind is a computer or is like a computer kind of falls apart there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. getting into your, your own work in your book, the, the main argument has two basic premises. The first is that our mental activity or our, our states of mind, as you call them, fluctuates along the spectrum from exploration to exploitation. And then the second is that the more aware we are of our states of mind, um, the better we can optimize for different tasks. So generating creative ideas versus really narrowly focusing to get something done. Um, I found that this framework is uh, as existing along a spectrum helps organize and put into context other discoveries about the, the human mind and cognition. Can you give us an overview about this spectrum and how we can kind of hack it to be more productive and also enhance our mood? Thank you very much for this question. You're keeping, uh, you, you keep raising these good uh, topics that I really love talking about. <laughs> I, I really enjoy it. So it's, um, we notice, and again, this is about the scientific process. We we notice in the lab, but also in the literature, and a lot of the work in the in the book is also by by my good colleagues and people that I know or don't know, but but excellent work from many labs. And I started noticing all kind of interesting correlations. So, for example, between the mood and creativity that ended up being on the cover of the of the book, right? So, noticing that people in good mood are more creative, and people that are more creative are in better mood. Of course, this is a gross generalization, and we can. We, there are always exceptions in, in, in individuals, but you start wondering why is this you know, mood and creativity go hand in hand? And we did develop a theory about it. I won't get into this, and it's not only a theory. We tested it and. And uh, we're also already trying to use it also for uh, alleviating symptoms of depression. But then we, we looked at other aspects and we see risk taking as in exploration, uh, openness to new experiences, uh, the scope of our attention and perception. And I'll explain what I mean. So in a certain picture, you may be looking at the forest or attending the forest or the trees, right? We all know that we can sometimes look at the big picture or, or other times we can be analytical and look at the details. So we noticed two things or kind of formalized two aspects of these uh, observations of many, many correlations between, between aspects of the cognitive mind that we haven't suspected before. One is that they are tied together. So when you are creative, you're also in better mood. Again, these are generalizations, but, but they are supported by, by a lot of research. So when you're highly creative, you're also in better mood and you're observing the world in a wider um, uh, flat, uh, uh, um, spotlight and you can be more open to taking risks and maybe exploring different countries and exploring new food in a restaurant or whatever this really uh, uh, applied uh, in everyday life and the other extreme when you're less creative uh, it does affect also your mood and you tend to see more the details etc and and the and the interesting aspect about it is that all of us it's very dynamic where we are on this it's not like this person is creative and, and this, that's a destiny and this person is not creative and nothing can, that, that we can do about it. What's magnificent here is that we realize that each one of us has a certain continuum that we can be more or less creative depending on a lot of on, on many aspects of our context. So one of them is this uh, uh, other properties that they said. So uh, if, if you're a boss of a team and you want them to brainstorm on a good idea, you, you need a solution, you need some creative solution for a 
troubling uh, a problem, you want them in a creative state of mind. So to, to you can't just tell them be more creative, even though interestingly in experiments of creativity, that stunned me that just telling participants beforehand, be creative, already raises the level of their creativity in the solution. So I guess we should all go with a sign, be creative, but not all problems, not all problems require creativity. I remember I was consulting to uh, Proctor and Gamble back then and the chief creative officer, we're talking about incidents where you don't really um, need creativity. So imagine you board a plane, which you do much less now, and you hear your captain today is John. John is a very creative captain. You, you don't want a captain, you know, uh, uh, or, you know, pilot to, to be creative. You just want them to be followed by, you know, follow the rules and do everything. I don't deviate from anything. So not in creativity is not, it, it's, it's kind of glorified and it is very important, but um, it's not always what we need. So the idea here is that we can, each one of us can be more or less creative and we can play with, you know, with these other parameters and see what are the conditions that magnify our own creativity. But as I said before, it's not necessarily destiny. It's more like a state that, that can change uh, depending on number, numerous of parameters. And that gets into one of the, the uh, themes uh, in the uh, book, book that uh, we have all these trade-offs. We, we didn't optimize for our well-being. <laughs> we optimized for survival. And so it's not necessarily always good to be in this creative state. Um, sometimes we have to really focus. Um, but how do you, if, if we all have accessible or available to us the ability to kind of nudge ourselves to be along this spectrum in different places, how do we do that? How do we kind of cultivate the awareness to be able to, yeah. um, to push ourselves? So I want to say two things. First of all, the whole idea of being in the moment, being in the present, like the beginning of your question, I know it's not really your actual question, but I, I want to just... Uh, uh, start with this there is this um almost myth that we always want to be in the moment but we have to understand that if our brain really would would have led us to be always now always in the present we will all be ran over by a bus in, in no time because really everything you do requires some planning some thinking about the future even if it's the immediate future so being always now it's really it has to be reserved for uh well-protected uh, situations where you can really let go of all your uh, worries and, and plans. Uh, so I do have in a book an appendix at the end where uh, the editor made me make uh, practical advice and we, it, was a, it was another trade-off, you know, he wanted to uh, sell the book with practical aspects and I'm a scientist and it's hard for me to kind of give prescriptions uh, uh, straight out of experiment so we, we met halfway and I think there are uh, many many uh, uh, tips there that people can elaborate on and adjust to themselves so it's not like you know wake up at 6 a.m start with push-ups and then eat a mango and then uh, so it's not that level but the idea here and it really sounds like a cliche but just understanding that our mind is both dynamic and many things are clumped together, like perception, attention, uh, openness to new experience, creativity, uh, the scope and, and mood. Then I play with it. I mean, I don't have well formulated tips, but I can tell you that for my own um, uh, experience that I take this into account. So just being aware, and I'm not saying that I, I just keep a counter, you know, what's my state now? What's my state now? What's my state now? But I do realize, and I do observe much more often, and just realizing that that we have this sliding state of mind that cl that clusters together many aspects of our mental lives can help us uh, manipulate things to our benefit. So manipulate in a good way, not that manipulate actually uh, sounds maybe sinister, but the idea here is really that you can modulate your state based on this knowledge. And if I just said that creativity is affected by mood and you want to be more creative, you can, you know, watch a funny movie or do something that improves your mood, then you're more creative. And this is very, um, a kind of a superficial advice, but the idea here is really to take into account, I call this the, all these dimensions of state of mind as entry points. So you don't necessarily, you can't necessarily tell yourself, let's attend the forest and not the um, 
and not and not the trees but maybe you cannot access your attention or you can't tell yourself feel better feel better feel better have happy mood this is not enough so maybe i can engage in some creativity problems or in some exploring something new being more explorer or expanding my attention scope and this will in turn affect the creativity so just keeping in mind that our state slides and also that we can uh, manipulate each of each its parameters through the other parameters uh, gives a lot of power in our everyday life, I think, in, in kind of matching the, our state with the, the task at hand. Well, so it's one thing to, to keep that in mind because Professor Barr is telling us to, but I suppose it's another thing to actually be able to, to do it. Would you recommend mindfulness training to, to get better at that? Or does that come with the costs of, you know, losing the, the immersive qualities that you were saying earlier that can be so yes. rewarding and beneficial? Wow, you, you really uh, read the book. I appreciate it. You know, it just came out today, and you're the first person I don't know personally that has have read it, and and uh, it excites me to think that uh, that it's out there. So, uh, first of all, I well, first first of all, I don't want to um, give the impression that I'm an expert in mindfulness. I'm 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 bad at it. I, I'm bad <laughs> because I maybe I, I don't persist as much as I want. I don't practice as much. So I'm not some Buddhist guru that everybody should follow in terms of my advice about meditation. But it has done a lot for me, not only as a neuroscientist. It has done a lot for me as a neuroscientist, but also as a human being. So I do recommend in the book that everybody should give it a try at least once in their life. And I'm not talking about 10 minutes of some application of uh, some app for um, for. Um, meditation actually finding the weekend I, pre I prefer a whole week weekend is not deep enough but just once in your lifetime you know we have many weeks in our lifetime lifetime just one week go for a retreat and learn about this thing and the thing that stunned me well, are many and they are elaborated in the book but the idea as a neuroscientist that i can actually observe my thoughts so not only be in this train of thoughts most of us go about our lives as passengers in this train of thought. It's as if the thoughts operate on us and we're just being dragged by our thoughts like a roller coaster. They take us to think about vacation. Now they take us to think about money. Then it takes us to take, they take us to think about our girlfriend and then it takes us to think about our pet or whatever. So uh, we just along for the ride. But then you realize that you can take a different perspective and this mind, what mindfulness uh, uh, um, practice has taught us that we can actually adopt a, a bystander perspective we can actually observe our thoughts okay so you imagine being with, with a train metaphor you can be on the on the station just in observing the train of, of thought and then you can you're able to characterize your thought maybe label your thoughts maybe understand the content the speed a thought is a very tricky thing once you start thinking about thought you realize it's not a monolith of just one type of thought and that's it thought can be fast can be slow can be broad can be narrow can be about certain topics so it's a very multi multifaceted um uh, thing that really makes us who we are in many respects yeah and the way that you describe it in the book i mean when it really sinks in it almost takes your breath away you realize that uh, your whole world just is your stream of thoughts and yet yeah. your emotions you know those are thoughts too as as you're interpreting them so mm -hmm. these things are you know, bubbling up from beneath our conscious awareness or they're triggered by something in our environments and we're essentially discovering them as they unfold. And our, our conscious experience, like you're saying, is this kind of train of thoughts in perpetual motion. And that's, exactly. that's what our experience is. And that kind of gets at these blurred boundaries between cognition and experience. Traditionally, they're thought of as very different, but your framework really brings them together. And so there are several fascinating things to, to discuss about this, but I'd like to, I guess, start within this blurred boundary between cognition and, and experience by asking you to um, outline these three types of, of thinking that you describe, the associative, ruminative, and, and obsessive, and how they're different. Oh, okay. So, uh, so as I just said, thought can be, uh, can be spent just like I was talking about attention and then and the in the forest and the trees. So our thoughts can so imagine our mind or we don't have to imagine well imagine your our mind the entire memory our entire knowledge our, our entire stored experiences and memories all stored in a giant net 
of things connected with each other, just like the internet and just like Google, I'm sure, uh, capitalizes on this associative manner of, of how things are represented. So everything is connected. There's no object, or there's no concept that has no connections in this network because then we won't be able to reach it, and right? So you can be, now that we think about this as a giant network of concepts and objects and things we know, Think about thinking as visiting different nodes, right? So you can, from neighboring nodes, you always move from one node to the other. There's no uh, very uh, big leap of thoughts. They say it, it sometimes exists in schizophrenia, but either if, even there, I don't believe that it's really just out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And and Freud has, as Freud has, has said it before me, but I think that in many respects, or I'm sure actually that every thought has an origin, but we're not always privy to the origin of these thoughts or the subconscious and all these uh, contentious uh, issues. So you imagine th your thinking process as walking on this giant web of concepts and, and objects. You, may, you can be thinking, you can be walking on this network by small circles and just being at the same topic. Let's say, um, Think about uh, a farm, okay? So you you may be th spending the next three minutes thinking about the cow, the, the cows, and the silo. Let's say silo or silo, silo, oh, yeah. uh, silo, and the hay, and the horses, and the farmers, and the farmers' kids, and the chicken, and the eggs, and you just surrounding the same topic for the next two minutes, or. It can be a free-flowing, broad, associative thinking that you, again, start with a farm, but then you think about uh, all McDonald's, and then you think about McDonald's, the, the burgers, and then you think about the saturated fat or whatever, uh, the current criticism against uh, whatever is there, uh, maybe um, um, happening now. And, and then from McDonald's, you go to like uh, maybe rest stops in uh, road trips. And then you think road trips, you think, I don't know, Rushmore, Mount Rushmore, this is my own road trip. So uh, uh, Mount Rushmore, then you think presidents, and then you think Biden. And that, from a farm, we got to Biden very quickly with, you know, with the seven steps. And while we could have stayed in the farm for the, the same seven steps. So one of them is narrow thinking. The other one is broad thinking. When narrow thinking, sometimes we do need narrow thinking. We need to solve a problem. You need to find all aspects of the same issue. So that's completely legitimate to be spending some time on the same area of this semantic network of representations. But if it's chronic and if you tend to be, and we can talk about the, the you know, uh, cortical mechanisms behind it, but if you are stuck on, on narrow topics chronically often enough, it can develop into mood disorder. So we know that one of the hallmarks of depression is actually ruminations, mm -hmm. speaking of farm. So rumination, being being stuck in the same, um, in the same, uh, in their case, it may be like a bad comment I made yesterday and I just keep, keep ruminating on it over and over and over and over. And the result is really uh, clinical depression. Broad thinking, on the other hand, is associated with creativity, with coming up with original solutions. So you can really be uh, either broad or narrow. And as long as these these things are temporary and easily changed, then you're a, you're a healthy uh, thinker. But if you're stuck in one of the modes, uh, either very narrow, or very broad, and you're doing this often uh, over and over, then it can develop into clinical uh, situations. So the broad and narrow is really the there are different, there's a whole list of, of thought disorders from thought intrusions and obsessions and others, but this is the, the the clinical aspect. But basically, we want to think about broad versus narrow, and broad is associated with this open mindset I talked about before, the creativity, the seeing the forest, being open to experience, and the narrow type of thinking is associated with being in a, in a not as good a mood and being more attentive to the trees, etc. And I suppose once you become aware of whether you are having a certain pattern of thoughts or another pattern of thoughts, you have a moment of maybe you would call that agency and you can decide, oh, I'm gonna continue this or not, but that's just a slight moment and the vast majority of, of our thoughts are kind of bubbling up or, or being externally elicited. So do you think the concept of, of free will is a helpful one or is it <laughs> our self-concepts totally illusion? Uh, so, there are two things here. And so the free will, we can talk about free will and my own personal belief about the lack of free will. But uh, but I think uh, when it comes to mind wandering, I see it as slightly different than free will proper. It's more like how much, it's similar to what you're saying. It's a sense of agency, how much conscious control you have over your mind wandering. And 
it's funny. Uh, it seems like it's pretty close to zero. Your our ability to control both entering and stopping. So you stop wondering when there's something in the external environment, you know, that calls your attention again. And you start wondering, it's not like, okay, I'm going to start wondering now. And I sit down and I, and I start to wonder. Of course, if you just lie in bed and you're, you're, you're uh, of course you will be uh, wondering, but uh, if, if, I lis if you listen to me and at some point I'm saying boring things or things you already know, you, your mind will start wondering without your conscious decision to do so. And you'll be brought back to this situation by either an, a noise or some sound or some signal that will grab your attention. So we don't really have much control over the mind wandering. I do have, speaking of, of tips and, and, and advice, one thing I play with myself, but this is not scientific, just the realization that mind wandering is always happening and it has content and I can't really dictate, but I can make things more likely to pop in my mind wandering space by priming them, by doing, so if I go for a long uh, run or, or I go for errands or whatever, uh, just before I step out of the house, I kind of maybe read a paragraph that's been challenging or, or, or poetic or nice in, in some way, or think about a problem that I want to solve and kind of warm up my neurons, so to speak, so that with this spontaneous wandering, uh, I'm more likely to bring up these issues rather than think about the bills I just paid or, or an, an annoying email or whatever. So you kind of replace uh, the ingredients that then mind wandering will uh, hopefully decide to use. And that gets a little bit into this idea of creative incubation or what some psychologists would call opportunistic assimilation, where you have that aha moment. Are yeah. there other, other things we can do? I'm thinking of like cultivating expertise in, in, in something to kind of prime you to be able to have more moments of, of that so that it feels good, but also you can contribute your insights. Yeah. So this, this is, um, Another fascinating topic, and and it seems like, um, you know, I, I held here in, in Barla in Israel uh, an event, well, they organized and I asked to call a specific guest uh, to speak about creativity. He's the most uh, creative, one of the most creative people I know, but he's a very famous chef in Israel. He also has off, uh, uh, restaurants in New York and, and, and across the world, Eyal Shani is name. And I was surprised with the turnout of, uh, to this event that we have like, you know, a, a big auditorium here and still it was flat. I never saw it as I used to be the director of this center and I never saw it so packed uh, until the, this idea. And in my introduction there, I said that, you know, if, if, if the event would have been how to add 15 years to your life, uh, the, the auditorium won't be as packed. People are just suckers for creativity and there's a reason for this. I mean, we do want to create. Creativity gives us good mood and that's what I said before and also in the book. So the idea here is really how to cultivate and I understand the motivation for your question, how to cultivate and I think we need to both understand from the book hopefully or just uh, from other discussions what are the elements that are required to maximize the likelihood. You can't force creativity. You can just, okay, I need a creative creative solution now. You need to be um, summoning it in a way. So yeah, you want to create the right environment. So you want to be not distracted, but also you don't want to have just a blank white wall in front of you. You do need some stimulation, but you don't want metal noise, right? You do need to be not bothered by other things. As I said before, the mood is specific. So if I know I'm grumpy, I didn't sleep enough at night, then I know this is not my time to look for creative solution. I'll do this tomorrow, okay? Or I'll just give some uh, uh, some general. Um... Yeah, there was something else I wanted to say, but hopefully it will come back. Well, I'll I'll poke you with a sort of related question, and maybe okay, we can come back to it. So <laughs> and we've been talking a lot about what you can do as an individual, what you can do personally to maybe nudge yourself along the spectrum, and and cultivate different ways of thinking. Um, but you've also written about maybe as a society, different things that we could do. So you use the example of public spaces and architecture. We could be designing these things to take into consideration human psychology and, and well-being. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe beyond the individual, what we could be rallying around to, yeah. to make sure that collectively we're all doing well? Yeah, that's a great point. I didn't remember that it was in the book, but <laughs> but yes, the idea here, uh, I once had an architect working with me in the lab and we together coined the term uh, 
conscious cities. It was uh, published in The Guardian in London. And, and the idea there is really to apply what we know and design cities and the urban environment to accommodate the, the specific needs of these locations. So, for example, uh, where soccer fans coming out of the of the tube or or, or the or the train, uh, you don't want to have kindergarten just outside there, right? You want maybe to have some concrete walls and something that leads them out and they spread immediately, right? So the same way you want to think about how would you design schools and classrooms to motivate, to, to increase the chances of creative thinking and the incubation that you mentioned. So uh, we do play with this a little bit. I don't, I don't think I can tell you these are the five elements of space that require, that will um, help facilitate creativity, but we're, we're on our way to be able to characterize this. But you're right that your environment affects how creative you are. I suppose I have to ask, because we're a tech company, do you have any thoughts on our relationship with, with technology? I mean, you, you say that a loaded mind cannot be a creative one. Are there better ways that we can think about interacting with the technology or de designing the technologies um, to help us be in these states or at least be more in control of interesting of the states? Okay, I haven't thought about this before, so let's have a brainstorming session. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yes, you're right, and this is an, an important concept that uh, was mentioned, and I and I didn't mention it here. The whole idea of cognitive load. So, tech company, you have a CPU. So, anything you take from the from the brain of the computer, uh, you're leaving left for other things, right? So, uh, if I'm busy talking or I'm busy cooking or busy busy doing other things. I have less left for me, both for incubation and coming up with new ideas. Interestingly, we already know by now that it even affects your ability to appreciate aesthetics. So mm. think about it. You come to the to MoMA and you look at a certain piece of art, and if your mind is busy with other things at the same time, you know, like 50% of your brain is busy with worries, you, you benefit or you enjoy this... Uh, piece of art to a much lesser much lesser extent and I can say and I know it's it's a discourse from your uh, from your question but we get back to the to the uh, tech tech stuff uh, the tech aspects uh, but it is important for me to explain that go back to depression for a second and rumination so remember how he said that ruminating around the topic obsessively takes away actually your ability so this is like a process being rumi ruminating takes away cognitive resources so by taking these cognitive resources there's not much left for you for other aspects of life that's why people in depression suffer from anhedonia for example they're not able to extract pleasure from the same everyday activities and my my ideas there here is that they're just occupied with other things that take away their machinery here i'm saying machine again machinery for um for appreciating this uh, so in the tech, I think we're all dealing with this in a different way. Uh, I had a student one once, and I think both she and I, uh, I don't want to say suffer, enjoy ADHD. So, uh, so her method was to have many tabs open. I mean, I have like 3,000 tabs open, but I didn't, I didn't use it as a strategy, more like a side effect. But she said that, I don't know, her father taught her this. So when you're tired of this tab, you go to the other tab, then you go back to the... So this was a way of, of uh, allocating, you know, riding with her uh, attention uh, disorder. So I think we all find, and you really have to watch my screen, the, the, to see my screen. There are so many opening windows here, but somehow the mind is able to focus and, and take... Well, not always. So we're still thinking about um, the possible, you know, what kind, I'll have to get back to you, but what kind of advice I can say when designing, uh, because again, people are so different. It does seem like a personal journey. For yeah. yeah. But well, I do. Maybe yeah. that's just it. Maybe thinking of, you know, personalizing different or giving the option to be able to personalize. Yeah. And things exactly. like that. Do you mind if I just expand on, on something that I forgot before and I realized yeah. that uh, what it was? Okay, so we talk about creativity and creativity is associated with this broad thinking. And people need to know about creativity. There's almost like, uh, well, in, not almost, but generally there is this uh, shape of a diamond that initially when you need to look for a creative solution, there's what we call divergent thinking. So it's like open up your mind. There's no bad idea 
And the same I tell people about, you know, brainstorming, creative uh, brainstorming session. There shouldn't be any sense or there's nobody supposed to be there and say, that's a bad idea, that's a bad idea. Everything goes. The, the stupidest ideas are fine. And this is the stage of where you're opening your mind. You're opening all possible solutions are, I mean, all possible solutions are okay. There's no funny, there's no stupid idea. But at some point, you need to close this diamond with convergent thinking. At the end of the day, you need to come up with one solution. So then you evaluate this individual many solutions. So there is this diamond, and, and in a way, you realize now that a creative solution requires two states of mind, right? So you need to be, so it's good that it slides. Initially, you need to be really open, right? Mm -hmm. Quiet and the right uh, level of stimulation, no uh, bothering thoughts, and then you're good in generating a lot of ideas. Now you need to close these ideas. Maybe you should depress yourself a little bit so you can focus and you can converge your thoughts. Or maybe you can do some other aspect that will narrow your thinking now so that you can have this um, one one best uh, uh, winning solution. So thinking this uh, uh, just, again, helps us understand how dy dynamic our mind is. That's great. Um, I think it's about time to open it up for questions from the audience. As we're waiting for that, I'll... I'll prime you with one more question. Um, so you had mentioned before that, you know, we all have the potential for thinking in these different ways, but are there any meaningful individual differences where some people are just more likely to be in this state of mind um, than others? I guess with clinically, yes, we've seen some examples. Yeah, yeah well, you are, you're right, but it's not only clinical. I mean, people do uh, are different. And even though I said everybody can be more or less creative, we can't take any everybody and make them Leonardo da Vinci. What we have to do uh we actually have to realize we all have our this envelope of then you know, we, we can we can we have a range an individual range so uh your minimum level of creativity could be also already higher than my highest possible creativity so we we all have our own range but within this range it, it's dynamic and we can change and go up and down yeah um i i think we have a couple of questions um See, what would it take for a machine to be called creative? Ooh, does it make sense to speak about creativity in a system with different functional organization than a human brain? How would you measure it? And that's from Tomek. Hi, Tomek. So it's a good question. Um, the, the question I'm waiting for from you guys is, can we make computers wonder and why? For what function? But let's stick to the question first. So... Um, Yes, definitely it can be creative and not only, you know, we've seen uh, creative uh, computers as in uh, drawing that uh, nobody expected. So one, one maybe dry definition of creativity is to generate something novel and useful. It has to be useful. I can't design a new cup with, with uh, something like it's closed also here. So it's original. There's no cup like this, but it's not useful. You can't drink from it, right? So you need to be original and, and uh, useful. So uh, it will be easier to address this question if we think about a specific domain. But by and large, uh, I imagine um, computers that in some circumstances uh, choose solutions that are not in their direct memory for a solution. So for example, one of our tests is called alternative uses test. So I'm giving, uh, we're giving uh, pictures or words to participants, so let's say a hammer, and you have to come up with as many alternative uses for a hammer and as quickly as possible, okay? So obviously, knocking pin, knocking nails, this is not the alternative. That's the, the intended. Now, now you can think about it as a weight, as a possible decoration to hang on the wall, uh, something to hold, you know, a doorstop, and as many as you can, you can come up with. So... Uh, yeah, I can, I, I can imagine a computer program that you tell it, you know, what else can you do with, uh, with, a, um, with a hammer and it will look on this semantic uh, web of possible characteristics and say, okay, uh, other than being a hammer, it's heavy and it's in shape. What else can we do with heavy things? So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely optimistic that we can uh, make computers creative and I won't be surprised if people already play with this. So the next question, just like deliberate mindfulness, is there an equivalent to deliberate, deliberate mind wandering or mindlessness? If yes, how can one engage in it? Yeah, so 
as I said in the beginning, mind modeling is really it's a it's a wild beast. You can't really um, harness it without really practicing. I mean, the meditation is a way to get some control over what's going on inside, but it's not necessarily something that, that gives you perfect control. The idea is that once you understand what are the conditions, well, the first thing I did with myself and with my friends is to remove the guilt over mind wandering. So very often it's the case where you're being caught that you wandered either by others or by yourself. It's like, oh my God, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't on, on, on my goal. I wasn't on my task. I was doing something else. So we always feel guilty. But then when you realize it is a productive uh, period, these rest periods for incubation, for generating new ideas and for, you know, uh, making novel uh, uh, experiences, uh, you realize that, you know, what are the conditions that that nourish this the most? And if you do, can I answer my own question now for a second? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I have a point I want to elaborate on. So in memory, you, you can ask what is what are the ingredients for mind, mind wandering? What, what, are the, what do we shuffle and reconstruct? So obviously these are things in our memory. And there's a curious thing about this because the mind is busy with so many uh, simulations. We always create these what-if scenarios, right? And an interesting thing is that I used to think, and until I started thinking about mind wandering, that our memories are based on our experiences. You touch the hot stove once, you realize you need to learn. You, um, you learn that you have to stop uh, touching these things. You, you, you learn what's the taste of lemon. You understand what is the feeling of uh, a, a cup falling on your toe. And, and gradually you accumulate all these experiences and then you can use them to guide you in the future. But what's amazing about our mind wandering and about uh, our mind in general is that we can also create these simulations. So I can sit here and imagine what would it, what would it feel uh, to drink to to eat tuna with pineapple, right? I never tasted it, right? But I can I can make this scenario and and I can create. And in the book, I talk about an example that always makes people f uh, laugh. I don't know why that I was sitting in an airplane and thinking about. It's an extreme example, uh, maybe not the everyday example, but. I was reviewing some paper and I was bored and my mind was, uh, my eyes were uh, uh, traveling with my mind and then I landed on the on the emergency uh, exit door. And then I started to think, what would happen? This is all deep in wondering. What would happen if this door would just uh, open and all of us will, will be uh, thrown out? And then I think, oh, we'll need a parachute, but I don't have a parachute, but I have this blanket on my lap. I can use it as a parachute, but it, it, it will the, the weed will take it out of my hands. I need some holes in this parachute, in this blanket. So I have a pen from reviewing this paper. I can make holes in, in the blanket, and now I have a, a parachute. So, of course, this is a ridiculous example, and most of our simulations are more about everyday, uh, most co more common things. But what I like to say here, to emphasize it, that our um, un largely underappreciated ability to learn also from imagined experiences. Mm -hmm. So you can be in your living room creating these new scenarios that never happen, then store them in memory, and they can be used as scripts in future situations that invoke them, just like real experiments, right? So real experience. So just like I was burned by, by a stove, and I know from firsthand uh, that it, that it that uh, yeah, is a danger. Then the same way I can take a, an experience that I imagined and benefit from it just the same way. So then, to answer your own question about can we get you know computers to be able to mind wander, and maybe that would get us closer to computers maybe resembling some of our abilities, programming some sort of seed for them to be able to s simulate things to to imagine whatever that would look like. Um, but we know in humans that that's also related to our embodiment. So our, our sleeping, our exercising, all of these things have have effects on our, our mind wandering and the states of mind that we're in. So I wonder if there's something there too with, you know, simulating embodiment <laughs> with with computers so that we can then, you know, be able to, to simulate um, or program other types of simulations. Yeah, I think people do it in robotics. I yeah. Agree that people uh, simulate embodiment in, in uh, computers, but I, I, I didn't, um, there was a reason I was teasing the last, uh, the person that, with the last question about a mind that my, that wanders. You know, my background is in, in computer science and I was there for the first, the previous wave of AI before uh, machine learning and, and uh, all this good stuff. And 
now that I cross to the other side of the human behavior and the human neuroscience, I realize that as computer scientists and engineers and technologists want to emulate or imitate the brain, we can only take the observable aspects, right? And you know that this is how we solve a mathematical problem. Let's try to imitate it in a computer. But here's a phenomenon that even us humans don't understand. Why is it there? Half the time of our waking hours, we're busy with it. There's got to be a reason. There's no way evolution has instilled in us this obsessive almost uh, um, uh, thoughts uh, if it has no function, right? So I think people have been modulated or, or, or um imitating the brain and computers by direct observations. And now we have to look deeper and say, if it's there, it has a purpose. Let's mod, you know, let's put wandering minds in computers and see what happens. And yeah. then you start to realize maybe there's incubation and ties to the previous co question about creativity in computers. Suddenly the computer will be more creative. So, uh, yeah. So I guess there's, I have a philosophical <laughs> question about the hard problem of consciousness, because, you know, when we think about computers, we're always just thinking about the, the cognition. We rarely think about the actual experience, but the way that you're talking about mind wandering and all of these associations, it actually kind of resembles the way that the, the hard problem is framed. What is an experience like? Why is it like this to experience something? And, you know, a lot of philosophers are, are saying that that that's never going to be able to be solved. But if we start programming in some of these simulations and, and abilities for computers to make associations and then their representations that become spontaneously linked, would that possibly be getting at some, could we hypothesize that maybe there's some sort of experience there? Uh... I'm not qualified to answer this question. Sure. I, I don't I don't, think, yeah, maybe nobody is. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think there's enough knowledge and I am hesitant to uh, to speculate too much. But you, you you are right that we do talk a lot also in the book about this issue of quality of experience. So this is not qualia proper as the hard problem in consciousness. It's not qualia. What does it mean to feel the, a, a, a toothache or, or the color uh, purple or whatever? But it is... Uh, it does put a, a, a light on this issue that we should mind the quality of our experience. So eating a mango is not always the same. And things that are happening in your mind while you're engaged in a certain experience would definitely affect your experience. Mm -hmm. So how you come, and we all know this, we can take being tired. This is not really a state of mind. It's just a state of body and mind. But being tired can make you less or more irritable, less or more uh, open to, uh, to enjoying new food in the restaurant or, or go sticking to your routine uh, order. So what's going on inside our mind affects the quality of our experience and experience is all we have. So really it's, um, it's important that we re re realize the connection between our thoughts and wondering and how we perceive an experience. Yeah. Looks like we've got another question here. I'm a beginner meditator. I'd love to deepen my practice with retreats, but in-person chances are rare these days. Don't like to do it online, can't associate much. Any advice? Well, you can come to Israel where people are less uh, diligent about these <laughs> guidelines, I guess. And we do have, no, I mean, meditating with a mask, this is, let me tell you, this is not fun experience, but we were able to meditate outside. So I guess my advice would be places like California with a better weather. You're in California, right? Or not everybody here is in California. We're all over the world. Yeah. All over the world. Okay. So I guess warmer places will allow having meditation outdoors and then outdoors, I think, alleviate this issue. So I feel for you. I understand why it's hard to meditate on Zoom or some podcast. I do need the, also the indirect, the, the direct uh, uh, interaction. I think you can find places, but you do have to probably travel because if it's closed uh, and cold and closed, then uh, yes, there is COVID. I think we might have one more question in the queue. Great. Is mind wandering connected to curiosity? I noticed on myself, then when I listen to audiobooks during every break, I'm less curious about things around me. Excellent, excellent question. Um, I do talk about curiosity and in and, and mind wandering in the in the in the in the book and the idea that actually curiosity and creativity it sounds both intuitive but also kind of uh, provocative that we in the lab talk about 
curiosity and creativity being two sides of the same process. So being highly creative is highly curious and being uh, uh, less creative, you're less curious. And this goes back to our conversation, maybe it was before we went on air, but the idea about kids, right? They have less prefrontal cortex, less inhibition, their thoughts are less guided by conventions and rules and, and uh, etc. But for the rest of us, we are limited by all this internal narrator and, and uh, all the inner chatter. And, and so when you're curious, you're creative. And when you're creative, you're curious by, by and large. So I'm not surprised at all by your experience that when you listen to an audiobook or just be, be busy with anything, if you're busy enough to suppress creativity, you'll also suppress curiosity. And um, try to be less busy, I guess, or expect that. This is the idea of incorporating the, this framework of states of mind into your, into your life. Now you realize that, yes, when I'm busy with something, be it an audiobook or whatever, or conversation, I'm less curious. But when I, there's enough room for me, it, it requires more than, than busy or non busy. We, I do talk about this in the book about the conditions that uh, maximize the chances of being curious. But there is a reason why we see in children the higher curiosity and creativity and, and the whole idea with top down with inhibition and things that we do need in order to obey some conventions, just like individuals in society. We do need rules to be able to, uh, but then you have to break some rules or think out of the box. It's always, you know, let's get out of this these limiting uh, walls and factors. So um, it's good that you recognize and others should also rec be able to recognize the conditions where they're more curious and creative and less. You mentioned this experience you had with your daughter in the book where she was looking out a window or something and you asked, oh, what are you thinking about? And she said, why do I have to be thinking about something? Yes. <laughs> looking at like She doesn't have a loaded mind. She's able to you know, then have more curiosity or creativity because she's not. Yeah. And I think right after this example of my uh, uh, beloved daughter, Neely, that she was just observing and nothing else is going on. I'm observing. I'm enjoying it. I give an example about me looking at the moon as fast and fascinated. I decided to dedicate the next 10 minutes to just looking at the moon because it was so beautiful. And I couldn't stay there for 10 seconds because, I mean, maybe it's boring. Maybe we're just, we need, we call, I call it still motion. We need to be moving also in our minds. Yeah. So we can, we can learn from meditation. We can learn from children. Exactly. <laughs> in, our, in our last couple of minutes, any other words of wisdom for us to take with us? Uh, other than, uh, well, we didn't touch upon the opening paragraph talking about immersion, right? Immerse living. So we do talk. So let me just talk about the mindfulness dilemma if we have another a minute or two. Yeah. Uh, because people did talk about mindfulness. So being a skeptical scientist, on the one hand, when I decided to try mindfulness, I decided to leave my scientist hat at home and give it a, a real chance. And I'm, I've been enjoying it. I don't want to go somewhere and dedicate a week of my life, which I do almost every year and be critical and not liking and uh, be you know be sour about the experience so either you're there or not so i decided to put it aside and i did learn a lot of things because of this open open uh, attitude but i realized the more practice i get i realized that mindfulness actually makes me adopt a, a, almost a narrator um perspective so let's think about three basic states to be in as with regard to mind wandering. You may I may be listening to you or just in pretending to listen to you, but my mind wanders somewhere else, right? I can be mindful of this experience and mindful my, being mindful of this experience is like telling to myself somewhere, I'm talking with Danielle, it's a fun conversation. I hope they like it. I hope they learn things from it. Uh, uh, here's the sweater is a blackish uh, color or whatever. I kind of narrate this so I'm in the moment. I mean, I'm completely in the moment. I'm, I'm highly mindful of every little things that in front of me. What bugs me about this state of mindfulness, and I know I'm going against the mainstream here, is that it calls for, a, again, for an outsider perspective. So you're not somewhere else. You're not wandering, but you're also not enjoying your experience. So as I, I give an example there, if you pay some money for... A, a uh, few laps with a Ferrari on one of these uh, race courses, right? I don't want to be wondering when I do this, that's for sure. I also don't want to narrate it. It's like, look, I'm driving fast. Here is the speed. Here is it. I want to be completely lost in the experience. And we, I call it immersion that you're just, um, that, that you're just giving in. And this is like a roller coaster. And in, in my opening paragraph, I give an example from BDSM just to be a little more provocative. But the idea here is really that you can 
apply this in your life also when you're going back to this mango I mentioned before, that you really can be immersed in a taste, not thinking about uh, the cashier that sold this mango to you, not thinking about what you have later, be really immersed in this experience and not narrating it. So this is like a third perspective of being either wandering, mindful, or immersed. And I think there's different times in life where you want to be in different types of perspectives. Well, thank you, well, thank so, you much. so much. That was wonderful, that was wonderful. and I highly I recommend your book to the audience. Thank you very much, Danielle. It was a pleasure for me. Likewise. Likewise.